Hi there. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Jesus changes water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests had, have had too much drink. But you have saved the best for now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Hi, welcome back to our music service. Uh, we're starting a new gospel series with the book of John. But uh, let me start our teaching with an old classic joke about our topic for tonight. Well, one night, a cop pulls over his pastor when he notices him swerving. As the officer approaches the window, he notices a bottle in the brown bag on the seat. Officer says, uh, Pastor, I, I pulled you over for swerving back there. You haven't been drinking, have you? No, sir. Why would you ask that? Well, I noticed that the bottle on the seat next to you, uh, oh, that's just holy water. Uh, okay, Pastor, so why is it in a bag? Well, that is to protect it from dirt, of course. Oh, Pastor, mind if I take a sip? Oh, not at all. I trust you. I, I always see you in my church every Sunday. As the officer puts the bottle to his lips and takes a drink, he immediately spits it out. Pastor, this is wine. The pastor replied, oh no, just like in Cana. It's a miracle. Oops, he did it again. <laughs> I learned you for the structure of John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. It's a typical miracle story, of course. The first inaugural sign of God's presence in the world through him, right? For me, I saw Jesus' glory being revealed in this story. There's a lot of things that has been revealed from this story, but I would like to focus uh, to two only. First, it was to yield that Jesus is an obedient son. Second, Jesus revealed as the blessed provider. Present at the wedding are Jesus, his disciples, and Jesus' mother. Never called Mary in the fourth gospel. She's the first uh, introduced, you know, She's introduced first because of her prominent role in the story. The need that arises is a lack of wine, as simple as that. Which obviously Mary reports to Jesus in verse 3 without explicitly requesting that he do anything. But you'll, you'll see her telling Jesus they have no wine, implies that she wants him to do something 
and she believes that he can solve this problem. Support the Mary. She just wanted to help. Jesus' response to her in verse 4 sounds rude and harsh to us, especially for, for us Filipino setting. No? <coughs> in Filipino culture, you don't answer that way to your mother or you get the rat of the chinelas. But actually, Jesus is not being hostile to his mother. The, the greeting and expression is to downplay the familial relationship between Jesus and Mary. Now, so that it can create a sense of uh, distance between them. It's just like uh, if ever my mother will be a witness in a court of law and I will be a prosecutor. Of course, I cannot call her, I will not call her mama or mama, you know. I need to address her as Mrs. G or whatever. Within the theology of John's Gospel, no human being, not even his mother, not even Mary, can determine Jesus' hour. That is saving, the, the, the saving work he does to restore the relationship between humanity and God. Remember, Jesus is in a mission. No human being, not even his mother, can that, that I mean Jesus' hour, when he's coming, when he's going, when he's coming back, when he's going to start the ministry, when he's going to end the ministry. God alone. God alone determines when and how Jesus our becomes a reality in this world. Monsignor, that Mary does not respond directly to him in verse 5 is a silent agreement on her part that he is to take the initiative to act. Yet by telling the servants, do whatever he tells you. Sabi ni Mary, Gawin nyo lang. In Filipino, sabi ni Maria, gawin nyo lang kung ano ipapagawa niya sa'yo. A phrase, no? Reminiscent of Pharaoh's expression of confidence kay Joseph the dreamer. No? Sa ability ni Joseph to address the lack of food sa famine sa Egypt before. Just like Jesus, no? I'm uh, sorry, just like Mary, I'm sorry, just like Pharaoh, Mary demonstrates a trust in Jesus. Just like Pharaoh demonstrated a trust to Joseph. She demonstrates a trust in Jesus' ability to address the need that has a reason. The disciples believe in Jesus after the miracle. But here's the thing. But Mary believes in the value of Jesus' word before it. Why? If there's one per person you know, that truly knows Jesus, that would be her birth mother. See, since birth, she's with Jesus. She trusts that whatever he says will work. Let's look at the first revelation of his glory in this story. The glory of an obedient son. What I have in mind, what I have in mind here is that Jesus exalts his sonship to the heavenly father above his sonship to his earthly mother. So when I call him an obedient son, I mean the son of his heavenly father, not the son of his earthly mother, not the son of Mary. Don't get me wrong. No doubt. He, he, was, he was obedient to his earthly mother. No doubt. But that is not the point here. In fact, I think Jesus' words are intentionally chosen to reveal a radical allegiance to God's will above his mother's will. 
and above all human attachments and affections. He, he could have said very gently, yes, mother, I know, I'll take care of it immediately. That's what, he's, that's what he did, but that's not what he said. He did it exactly as he says. Yes, mother, I know, I'll take care of it immediately. That's what he did, but that's not what he said. That makes us, uh, that makes us ask why he spoke to her this way. If you're going to do what your mother has in mind anyway, why don't you simply agree with her and then do it, right? Why the uh, off-putting words, pa? I think the answer is that Jesus felt a burden to make clear not only to his mother and his brothers and sisters, but to all the rest of us, that because of who he was, physical relationships on earth would not control him or oblige him. His mother and his physical family would have no special advantage to guide his ministry. And his mother and physical family would have no special advantage to receive his salvation. The reason is that Jesus was absolutely bound to his Father's will in heaven and to no one on earth. This was the lodestar, the guide no, of Jesus. And there could be no competing controls on his life. I remember in John 8, 28, said to Jesus, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Here's the thing. A lot of us thought, that because Jesus said yes to Mary, we should start praying to Mary. Instead, since he is favored by her son, Jesus, his miracles are not at his mother's disposal or anyone else's. He is entirely in the sway of his heavenly father. He and the father are one and they have one will. We need to understand this very important truth. Followers, not family. Followers, not family. <clears throat> Jesus had to work against the assumption of this day, of his day and this day actually, that his physical family had an inside chalk of influence and blessing. Nepotism, special favor, doesn't work in spiritual realm. Recall the time that a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. In Filipino, pinagpala ang babaeng nagdala sa sinapupunan niya. Ikaw, no, na dinala niya sa sinapupunan niya. At ang kanyang uh, dibdib na nagpa, nagpadede sa iyo. The, the woman, we're, we're talking about Mary. But he said, Jesus answered, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Luke 11, 27, 28. In other words, people thought, there would be special spiritual advantage in being the mother of Jesus. But Jesus cut off that assumption and focused attention not on physical relations, but spiritual relations. But another time, the people called to him while he was speaking in the house. Remember, 
Uh, sir, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. In Filipino, inahanap po kayo, nananay niyo, tsaka ng mga kapatid niyo. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here, I my, here are my mother and my brothers. Mark 3, 32 to 34. In other words, followers, not family, have a saving relationship with Jesus. Faith, not pedigree. What do I mean by this? This is what we are seeing in John chapter 2, verse 4. Let, let's look back. According to Mary, they have no wine. The answer of Jesus, woman, what does this have to do with me? It is like telling to Mary that Mommy Mary, Mother Mary, your relationship with me as mother has no special weight here. Please don't get me wrong. I have no intention to be rude. I'm just telling the truth. This is the spiritual truth. You are a woman like every other woman with due respect. Oh. My Father in heaven, not any human being, determines what miracles I perform. And the pathway into my favor is faith, not family. This is actually very good news for us. It doesn't matter what family line we come from. Imagine, your parents may be the most ungodly people you know. That will not keep you from the favor of Jesus. Faith, not family, makes you his friend. So first, we see the glory of an obedient son. Part of Jesus' glory is his radical freedom from family partiality and his radical allegiance to his Father in heaven. We have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, John 1, 14. That's why we need to worship Jesus alone. That's why we need to understand that we don't have to worship Mary. We can adore her. We can respect her. We can, we can uh, emulate her. Wow, for me, one of my biblical heroes is actually Mary. Be it unto me according to your word, according to your promises. I will stand secure, guard upon my heart the truth that sets me free. According, be it un, according, according from your word, be it unto me. That was my guiding principle when I entered the ministry. Mary was young, but she is heroic. She's faithful. He said yes to God to do this special task. I adore her. I admire her. I respect her. She's, she's one of my, I looked up to her as one of the best biblical characters. And I don't worship her. I worship Jesus alone. For me, the way, the truth, and the life, it's Jesus alone. Need to understand. First, we see the glory of an obedient son. Part of Jesus' glory is his radical freedom from family partiality and his radical allegiance to his Father in heaven. We need to have that kind of boldness, to have this radical allegiance to our Father in heaven a radical allegiance to Jesus. We need not to bow down to any images. 
We need not to bow down to any saints or whatever. Saint Paul is worth emulating. There's a lot of saints who are worth emulating, worth admiring, but not worth worshiping, even Mary. That's why we need to be focused to worship the one true God, and that is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Number two, this is a revelation of the glory of an all-providing bridegroom. In John chapter 3, verses 29 to 30, John the Baptist speaks one last time about the superiority of Jesus. He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. It's pertaining to Jesus as being the bridegroom, the bride, that's us. The friend of the bridegroom, that's him, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom, bridegroom, bride, bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He is also my guiding principle that when I entered the ministry. I must increase and he must decrease. I'm sorry, I must, in, I must, he must increase and I must decrease. Sorry, Lord. Every time I preach, I always talk about Jesus. I always talk about how I will lift him up. I always talk about his glory. Even the story is all about me, my testimony. Always in the end, the one to be glorified is Jesus. Coming from the mouth of a person who's keenly related to Jesus also. John, cousin, remember? It's not about breed. It's not about blood. It's not about affiliation. It's not about family. It's about faith. The last thing John says about Jesus in this gospel is that he is the bridegroom who has the bride. His bride then was his growing band of disciples that became us when they, the disciples turned the world upside down in the book of Acts. And the first miracle Jesus does is to complete what the bridegroom at the wedding could not do. In the Philippines, it is customary for the groom to pay for the wedding. Here in the States, it is the father of the bride. That's why I told my son to get married here. And my two other daughters must be married in the Philippines. For me, Jesus is a perfect groom. John chapter 2 verses 9 to 10 shows that the groom was finally responsible for the wine as, as his wedding. That's their custom. Excuse me. Which means it was his uh, shortcoming. It was his fault that let the wedding run out of wine. In verse 9, and the master of the feast, not the groom, but the head waiter, tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Now see who is really in charge of the wine, not the, bride, not the bridegroom. Uh, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And of course, the point is, no, he didn't. He let the wine run out. 
I remember it was 1997 when I got married. Credit card is not that prominent yet. We need you know, people back then pay cash. And I have this bunch of cash in my back pocket. I was wearing a white tuxedo that I rented from Gardini for 500 pesos. And uh, I was, I remember I was counting the number of tables. Every time they would add the number of tables that I uh, ordered from, I was counting the money with, you know, is it enough? It will, 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 will it be enough after the banquet is over? Well, good thing the Lord provided for me. But the thing is, I was so, I was perspiring and I was like, I cannot concentrate really in the, in, this, in the banquet because I cannot eat that much because I was afraid that, uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to pay for, for the banquet and I have to, instead of going to my honeymoon, I'll be probably washing dishes at the back area. The, the thing is, going back to the bridegroom, he let the wine run out. That's why it is with the grooms on this earth. All husbands fail to be all no, to, that we ought to be. But quietly, you know, as we as we all husbands fail to be all that we ought to be, quietly, but quietly. The omnipotently Jesus plays the role of the perfect, all-providing bridegroom. That's the best picture. Sablaika. You let the wine run out. Here comes the all-providing, omnipotent Jesus. Out of water comes wine. Miracle. Better than any husband could provide. And remember, who's the husband? Jesus. Who's the wife? Who's the bride? The church. It's a picture of a future union, a future banquet, a future wedding that will come, that will come into pass in the future, that this good provider will provide for everything from love, mercy, forgiveness, salvation, and everlasting life. The second way Jesus manifested his glory at this wedding was that he showed himself to be the all-providing bridegroom for his bride, the great assembly of all those who trust in him. As I end, for me, the glory of Jesus is overflowing with grace. Each of these two manifestations of glory being the obedient son, the all-providing bridegroom. These are, all, these are all overflowing grace. These are all overflowing with grace. From his fullness, we receive grace upon grace. As the obedient son of God, he is not swayed by his family ties. Not Mary's and not yours. He is the Son of God. He is God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is swayed by those who despair of pedigrees and trust His grace. He is not, you know, the friendship towards Jesus is not by family relation. It's about faith. It's not because you're related to him. No, it's about faith. No nepotism. It's about faith. It's about true relationship. It's about accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. Establishing a good relationship with him. Living a life that in, intends you to do, to live. No? Uh, and all the, the second thing, the all providing bridegroom, he never never, never fails to give us what we need. 
the life-giving wine of his death in our place never runs out. He is the perfect, all-providing husband to his church. From all the things that we need here on earth, from all the things that we will be needing in the future, from all the things that we will be needing in the perfect place that he prepared for us. Jesus is our blessed provider. Thank you for being with us tonight, being with, being, being with us tonight and uh, I have to learn something from the beautiful story of, it's a different perspective, you know, in a sense. But uh, I hope you understand that Jesus' intention is to love us, to forgive us, to have a relationship with us. Jesus' intention is to provide for us from whatever we need right now until he until he meet us to eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for your beautiful story about the wedding in Cana. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for your love. Thank you for choosing faith than pedigree. Thank you for being the blessed provider for us. Thank you for being our husband. Thank you, Jesus, for, for all the love, compassion, the mercy, the forgiveness. We ask your forgiveness, our God, if there's anything that we said, if there's anything that we did, if there's anything that we thought of that is uh, not um, it is not um, nice, Lord God, in front of you. We ask for forgiveness, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to accept you as our personal Lord and Savior. Today, we accept you as our personal Lord and Savior. And for those people, Lord God, who have been a believer for so many years, we would like to take this opportunity to, to dedicate our lives to you, to accept you again as our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a pleasant Wednesday evening. God bless you.